I'd like to thank you everybody today for attending our May uh, 2020 URISA Texas Speaker Series. Today's presentation is by Consortech and it is on Discover the Power of FME. Uh, our presenter today is Leslie McKenzie. She's got over 15 plus years of experience. She specializes in extract, transform, load, uh, ETL, uh, and leveraging it. And she is a graduate of uh, McGill University with a Bachelor's in Arts and Geography. And she also was uh, the presenter for three of the full day Eurus of Texas workshops uh, that we did a few months ago in Fort Worth, Austin, and Houston. So Leslie, we appreciate you being here today and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and mute everybody. If uh, anybody has any questions, put them in the chat window and we'll read them for a Q&A session afterwards. Leslie. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Francois, I think uh, you're gonna do a few of these slides. I'm just gonna- Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in uh, Brian as well. So uh, my name is uh, Francois Lagagnard. I was also with Leslie at the, uh, at the workshops. I'll do the very, very uh, brief introduction. So you'll have like the most, most of your time with uh, Leslie. So look at, looking at today's agenda. So you're seeing like uh, today's objective, who we are. It's important, like we've decided to, uh, to add a quick, uh, four or five minutes overview of FME to remind people who attended the workshop and also to give a bit of context to others that may have not attended. Uh, we'll talk about very briefly like FME, uh, the, the industry trends with regards to FME and of course like the heart of the presentation. So uh, use cases and best practices with FME. So today's objective is seeing it. So uh, demonstrate how organizations are leveraging the FME technology through some uh, like our most popular uh, use cases. I'd say like the, the uh, use case handpicked by Leslie and her team just for Eurus of Texas. And very briefly, like who we are Consortex. So we are a GIS and we are GIS and a data integration expert. We're a small company out of Montreal, Canada, but with clients all across North America. Uh, we have a very, very strong focus and a niche expertise on the FME technology. And uh, such like we are a safe software partner and reseller. So the only one in North America with the uh, platinum level. Uh, so what we do, we resell the software. We provide training, coaching, can be virtual training, virtual coaching. And we also uh, take on some uh, projects as well. All right. So, um, like we said, we just wanted to give a really brief overview on what is FME, um, just in case, um, you know, there's people out there who, who maybe didn't uh, attend the, um, the training in uh, February when, uh, when, when we did those, uh, those workshops in the, in the three cities in Texas, which, by the way, was my last trip <laughs> before the lockdown of everything. So, it will, I will definitely remember that. It was long, that. long ago, Leslie. It was, I know it was a long, long ago, but like, you know, I still think about it. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's fun. yeah. Um, so what is FME? FME is a spatial ETL software. So what does that mean? ETL, ETL means extract, transform, and load. So it's used for uh, pulling data from one place, like we see data from A, data from B, or can be multiple, many places, transforming that data. And that means manipulating it, um, you know, and doing different operations to that data and then, you know, loading it, which is, you know, exporting it to C. So um, even though it started off as, as a tool that was really, really, really originally designed to convert data from one GIS format to another, um, and, you know, back in the uh, ancient old days, it might have been like map info to, you know, Esri uh, arc info or something like that, um, you know, with time, First of all, the number of formats continue to grow, but also what we use this kind of software has also um, grown with time because while we're converting data from one format to another, we're often having to transform the schema, attribute names, types of attributes, domain values. So as the number of tools to manipulate data grew, well, other kinds of functionalities became possible. Uh, validation, it's used in integration. So today we might not just be converting data from one format to the other and it ends there. It might be a regular integration between data in different systems or so it might be repetitive. It might be in a near real time basis or it might be a, a once a day um, 
transformation. So, um, and then, uh, and, uh, and so like I said, automated repetitive processes. This little graphic is just like a fun one. You can just see that not only did the number of formats for the conversion part of FME grow with the years, but, but you know, um, you know, the types of formats have uh, just expanded as well. And a lot of them have, an, uh, ha have a basis in, in being either tabular data, like database data, or uh, have a basis in being spatial. But what the spatial data mean? It doesn't just mean GIS data, it can mean CAD data. So in the earlier years, but now we're starting to see um, support for data formats in you know, the space of the cloud or the or big data or indoor mapping. So, you know, the types of data that we can integrate and that we work with or that have a spatial component has have just grown uh, for the years. So today FME supports conversion between, uh, you know, upwards of, of, you know, like 500 formats. Um, as an integration platform, so it's more than just a tool to um, convert data from one format to another, it allows us to automate data processes. So we have, FME comes in three flavors. We have the FME desktop, which is the tool that we use to build and author these data workflows. And it might remind you a little bit of the Esri data model builder. Um, um, and then we have FME server, which is a way to deploy those scripts that we, uh, that we develop on FME desktop. And this allows us to build automation around it. A file arrives in a folder and we kick off a process or a scheduled time ar uh, arrives and a process kicks off or a chain of processes kick off. So um, automating uh, becomes very important uh, as there's just more and more data to manipulate and keep moving through an organization. And FME Cloud, which is um, FME Server, but as a SaaS, uh, available as a software as a service. So that would be great in the context where I'm working with data that lives primarily in the cloud. So data where I might be, uh, you know, have some data in ArcGIS Online or have some, some data in some other, uh, you know, like AWS or Azure kind of platform. Um, so it allows us to, like I said, connect our data sources, transform our data, and automate our workflows. So that's just a really quick capture of what is FME. So it's a, it's a tool that allows us to build data processes uh, with a strong tool set around spatial data and, um, and, and to automate those processes, meaning to have them run on their own and kick off based on, you know, actions and reactions to things. So Francois, did you want to, did you, did you want to say a little, a little thing about the introduction, maybe introduce, you know, the premise yeah. for how we built this presentation? Exactly. So like how we, we built it, it was from uh, many clients, oh, sorry about that, that's my dog. Many clients asking us about like how they could leverage FME in their organizations. So they were like long-term clients, they were using it, they were loving it, and they wanted to like get the most out of it. So that's the, that's the name of the presentation. So what we did, like we reviewed like the project we've been doing over the past few years and looked at like the trends and patterns and like what came out, out of that. So it allowed us, allowed us to categorize like the projects uh, we, uh, we did like in four, uh, four main categories. So, and you'll see like the categories. And uh, so like while you're, uh, you're reading those, uh, Leslie also mentioned it a bit like most, uh, like most of the time, like FME starts in an organization more as an ad hoc GIS tool, like to do like the data conversion validation, like all that she explained mostly of course in GIS department. And uh, then usually what happens is that it's like grows organically and then switch to the, uh, to the uh, like corporate side of it via like the server, uh, server version that Leslie also mentioned. Uh, and then now what we see is more that the GIS group are more like integrated or linked uh, within like corporate IT. So we're seeing FME being like more leverage into solutions that cross like departments and application or systems. So that's the, like in the nutshell, like the, uh, the genesis of the organization, of the uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, I'll start with the uh, the first category. Okay, so the first of these uh, of the four categories. So what we did is we we looked at all the projects that we've been doing recent years, and not just projects we've been doing. Projects our clients have been accomplishing, you know, because we we coach clients on how to use an FME. So they also do some interesting projects, and we decided to pick um, projects that 
you know, we, we realized they kind of fell into four main categories to help people in local government kind of understand, or even in any organization really understand the types of uses we saw with FME. So the types of projects that we kept coming, we saw coming back that we kind of grouped as growth management were often things, uh, problems related to, or pain points that an organization has related to population, data, and technology growth. So if you're a growing city, then just your growing population is going to create pains around maintaining services and all the data related to that. And the fact that your staff may not actually be growing as fast as your population is growing, right? You have to wait for those revenues to come in and see what your needs are and expand and buy new products and buy new solutions. You outgrow the solutions that you already had in place. But not only, but even if you're not in a situation where your population is growing, there's also been a lot of data and technology growth. So around the same assets we might be managing in a city or around the same things that we have going on, we have more tools, we have more applications, we have more services, and all of these new applications that we have, they all produce data. So the growth of technology, so the, you know, if you can't grow your staff fast enough to help manage all that technology, you need solutions to do that. Um, questions around difficulty to predict a city's income, how much infrastructure was put in, how much assets do they own? A lot of these kinds of questions get answered by pulling data and information out of many different systems. So the, the project I'll present today in this, in this category um, is uh, the town of East It's a, uh, and it's their project for corporate data automation. This is a very small city. Uh, it's a suburb. It's actually quite a far away suburb outside the city of Toronto in Canada, our largest city. And this um, relatively rural at the moment little city will double in population in the next 10 years. And so they have a lot of development projects going on right now. And they needed to find a way to coordinate the information across the city because when somebody moves into a house, all the services become activated for that city, right? That person can get a library card, that person can buy a recreation services, that person can, you know, access the, at like the services a city have, uh, you know, when the street gets assumed by the city, they have to, you know, they have to clean the street, they have to inspect the street. All these things kind of come into play. And one of their challenges was that the staff is very small. So the idea of, you know, growth outpacing, so either technical or digital growth, or, you know, you just even population growth, they have one GIS person who is also the IT person, basically. So they have two IT people and one of them is 50% IT, 50% GIS. So it was very difficult to track growth in the city and ensure the coordination of all this information and services among all the different departments. So the solution they implemented was they put into place an Esri map development dashboard. So a map showing all the development projects, all the, all the parcels, all the properties that are being developed and what their status is. So completed, not completed, uh, under construction. Um, and, uh, and on the back end of that, they're using FME desktop workspaces. So workspaces that were developed in FME server to automate the process of keeping all the information in sync. And also they develop certain specialized reports for um, parks department and uh, upper management. So this is, a, this is a graphic they drew of their solution. So we're there, so uh, an FME server process, you know, uh, kicks off uh, every, every day at 6 a.m. and pulls all the new building permits, occupancy permits and fire break permits uh, from the permit application and pulls all the parcels, joins them together and produces a number of outputs. So the number of outputs are those, are those things that I mentioned, the reports and the map. Um, they also have a second FME server process that's kicked off by a different kind of automation. So the first thing is a scheduled task. This one is a directory watcher. So when the field workers are installing water meters in the city, they're actually filling that information into an Excel file and um, they, ha they basically drop that Excel file into a folder at the end of the day. So they hire contractors to do this and the contractors submit an Excel file, gets dropped into a folder. FME picks up the file automatically with a directory watching capability. So, and uh, basically integrates that data to the map as well. So joins that information with the properties and produces a point so that they can at least very rapidly have an idea of as the houses are getting moved into that they have, they know that they have covered their, you know, the, um, the water meters they need to install. 
It allows them to track the, the work of their contractors and allows them to track the development uh, of the town. So this is just a different view of the same solution here. So they're using City View as their permitting application and they're using ArcGIS and with our, an ArcGIS DE database uh, to manage their uh, GIS data. We join the schedule process and FME server joins the two together. If the records don't successfully join, so there's a mismatch between a record and city view, it can't find the associated parcel in the development project, uh, there's an automatic email that's sent out with a report back to the buildings department. And the buildings department then makes, usually it's the correction in city view that needs to happen because the addresses in this case happen to be typed in by hand. So that's, and that's the main link with the parcels. So um, these things are sent on a daily basis. What does this data process look like on the back end, at the back of the, uh, uh, on the back end of this? So what FME server is executing every, um, every morning at 6 a.m. looks like this on the back end. So this is the thing that nobody really sees unless you're working with FME desktop developing this process, but basically we're pulling data from the permits, pulling data from the parcels, joining the information together, producing some reports. If it doesn't join, doing some cleanup of the data, and, uh, and this kicks off and uh, runs very quickly. So every morning when everybody comes into the office, they, they have a, an up-to-date picture of the town and what's, what's been uh, issued. So the results, the information is delivered across the organization efficiently and reliably. So everybody always has an up-to-date view of what has been, you know, what has, what, which houses have been issued occupancy permits, meaning that house is now, somebody is able to move into that house now. Uh, it's scalable, the solution. So it, the solution wouldn't require more manpower if development pace increases, meaning if, uh, if two, develop, two more development projects start, you know, new phases, for instance, uh, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be more work for them to have this information moving across. And the town is able to adapt and add more reports uh, easily at little cost. So, you know, with FME, they've been able to adapt new reports and extra output. The water meter project, for instance, it, wa it wasn't in the original um, request because the original request was really focused on which houses had been moved into. But when the water department saw this possibility, they said, well, we'd like to see our work too progressing. So, uh, you know, and that was easily just adapted on uh, to the process. So it's scalable and it's modular and things can be added and, and removed easily. Uh, and it actually uh, benefited them in terms of improving the quality of their data. So because they're constantly integrating their permits and checking them against their parcels, um, they know that they're never going to they're, they're not going to have a growing amount of mismatch from, you know, uh, human introduced errors. So their data quality is, 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 is improved in general because of that. So these are just some screen caps of what it looks like. Like the brown properties are the ones that they have moved in, uh, that, that are, have um, permits issued for uh, construction. And uh, so there's building permits issued. The green ones are occupancy permits that have been issued. The blue dots are the water meters that have been installed. And the red properties are fire breaks lots. So that's lots that have been designated by the fire department as do not construct until all the surrounding properties have been constructed to prevent, um, to prevent fire construction fires from, uh, from, from spreading if, uh, if a construction fire happens. Uh, some of the other reports. So um, while the map is useful and interesting and provides a broad uh, amount of information, and in fact, in, even inspectors in the field can check and see, ah, I'm standing in front of this property X and it should not be under construction because it's actually a fire break lot. It's useful, but some people need information in more of a statistical manner. So they've built some reports. So this is the, this, the report they did for upper management. So number of units that are being taxed versus the occupancy permits that have been issued, meaning houses that are complete versus the number of building permits. So they kind of have a moving picture of how many units are going to be taxed in the future, or they have a get, they can see the gap between the number of units that are being taxed versus the number of houses that have been moved into or possibly moved into. And for the parks department, they said it was great, the map, but what they really needed was the percentage of completion of each development project so they could go back and see the developers and say, you're at 50% and you need to, to bring the money in from the, for the parks. Um, or you need to start construction on the park so that you can get, you know, your approval to start phase two. So, you know, this became an, a, a, this is the way the information spoke 
more to the parks department than, you know, a map. Um, we just like to highlight, they're very proud of this project, East Gwillimberry. They, uh, they won a number of awards. They won a ERISA North America award for this project and they run some IT, municipal IT awards as well. Uh, Francois, I think you have a poll question. I don't know how we're doing the poll questions. Is it Brian who's going to do that? Oh, the poll just popped up. Yeah, and the poll is just to know, like, to uh, to what extent, like, the uh, the pain and challenges that our clients are facing, if like uh, they can be also applied to the uh, University of Texas community. Managing increasing amount of data and formats. Yeah. Yep, I would say that uh, and consolidating information from various systems. Those are definitely the ones that a lot of people find challenging, just more and more data. All right, cool. Yeah, it's pretty common, uh, I'd say, a result. Yeah. All right. So the second category uh, we're going to present is, um, you know, uh, challenges around asset management. So asset management could be like things that we're doing in public works, um, you know, engineering and things like this. Um, and a lot of the pain points that we run into in this where data processes come into play, um, you know, there's a lot around aging infrastructures um, and managing them and, you know, having a clean inventory status. So a lot of needing to validate the quality of uh, the inventory, for instance, because some of these GIS inventories of, of assets had been, you know, developed over, over many years. And so there's different qualities of information. You know, maybe they don't have the, the make of all the hydrants because maybe it wasn't something that collected in the early days. You know, there, there's, there's like varying qualities of data uh, which makes it then hard to predict replacing things or repairing things. So the better the quality of your data, the more you're gonna be able to use some of that next generation of tools where you're gonna be able to like predict, you know, um, predict the manage management. Um, and also again, kind of like the growth, around the growth management, it's also related to the same thing. The data volume is definitely increasing in the world of asset management. We just have so many more devices and smart devices and new meters and now there's there's driven lidar and flown lidar and and drone data and you know you know there's a lot of people implementing survey one two three and collector and arcgis tracker there's there's a lot of new ways to capture more information about assets to manage them but it's all more data um so the first one we're going to present today is a case we did with the city of Henderson. Um, and this is a CAD to GIS uh, data conversion project. So this is a city in Nevada with a population of about 310,000. They're a fast growing city. And um, their objective in this project was to streamline the asset handoff process. So their original process was, um, you know, a mixed set of steps that involved a lot of converting data to PDFs and then to GIS and then back to PDFs and to CAD and then back to PDFs. So there's a lot of duplicate entry, a lot of information loss. So as assets got, you know, developed and then assumed by the city, uh, you know, the process was a lot of conversion before getting data into, into a GIS, for instance. So what they decided to do was streamline this data process and implement a new asset handoff process. So the, the, the act of when a city assumes the assets from a developer. So um, to do this, they developed a few tools. So they implemented some CAD standards. So implementing CAD standards um, in their case involved saying that uh, data had to be submitted in a specific structure according to a specific layering standard. Um, and also there had to be some attribution. Uh, they developed a clip and ship tool. So this allowed developers to start with a cut of the base data that was already in the proper data structure that they wanted. And they also created the CAD validator tool, which is where we'll showcase FME and the solution to automate the quality and control and the conversion. 
So what does the technical solution look like? Um, so the CAD data gets read in by the process and there's some validation. So there's some spatial validation. Is the geolocation correct? Um, there's some attribute processing. So they gave a number of ways that attribution, so could be submitted. So there are some ways to store that in CAD data or to store it as a separate Excel file with a link, but attributes had to be delivered. They gave them about three or four different choices on how they could do that. Uh, and FME has been adapted to read the, the data from those different options and to, and to pull it in, you know, regardless of the, of the method the developer chose to submit the data. And then there's some error reporting, so uh, in different formats. And, uh, some, and then finally, if when the data passes, it gets converted to a geodatabase. So they also take a step of getting the data into the GIS. So this is just an example of what the CAD validation workspace looks like. So this is the FME process. So the validations include coordinate systems, spatial boundaries, the attributes, we're checking that the values and the ranges, the presence of certain attributes, the schema matches the required schema, that the ranges fall into the right values. Uh, and the reports are, are, are produced in different formats. So sometimes in some AutoCAD formats, in some Excel, but also in JSON, which is sent back to the web in the form of a web report that they get back at the end of uh, the process being run. So the results for them by, by implementing this process uh, was a uh, reduced data integration time by as much as 75%. And because we also did this, so we didn't do the development for them, we did coach them through the development. They had a bit of FME skills, but not enough to really work solidly with like AutoCAD type data. And, and also, you know, the idea of how to produce reports and produce feedback and do validations. So we did coaching on all those skills and techniques to work them through this project. So this client also upped their skills in FME at the same time as accomplishing their project. Poll question number two. Anybody want to put this out? one is really an interesting one. Always uh, curious to uh, to see the results. Mm. Around the 20% mark for the situation. So some people have standards, some people don't, and some people just don't deal with CAD data, which is normal because it depends what your role as a GIS person necessarily is. All right. 17% of enforced CAD data. That's a, that's a good number. Yeah. It's actually higher than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Energier. So this is a second example that's quite different actually that we're going to present in the space of asset management. Um, this is a natural gas distribution company here in Quebec where we live and um, they are the main gas distribution companies. So they, we should have changed this to miles. <laughs> 11,000 kilometers of underground pipe network. Francois, you should take a note of that. Um, so uh, yeah, so th this pipe network, it needs to be inspected on a regular basis. And so the objective of the project that we did with them this year is actually to streamline the geoprocessing of inspected pipes. So for real time following of the inspection work that's being tracked by vehicles. So this is an example of what their, uh, this is a screen cap of their pipe network actually. And um, so what they need to do is all pipes have to be inspected by a truck carrying a leak detection device. And there are different programs. And, the and so some of the pipes have to be inspected more often than others, depending on you know, geographically the rule set and the types of pipes and different information like this. And the planning group, so the group that plans the work for the vehicles and the trucks that are out there, they use SAP to track the progress and do planning of work schedules. However, there was already a lot of manual steps and work because uh, at the beginning, there was no GIS tracking of this work. Um, so the solution they implemented has many components to it. So I'll, I'll explain the components and what FMEs 
uh, FME server's role was in this. So here in the middle, we have their truck, you know, and uh, on their truck, their truck is mounted with multiple devices. So it's mounted with um, the gas leak detection device. So this actually produces its own data that I'll, I'll talk to in a minute. Um, and they also are using, they implemented actually collector for ArcGIS to collect some data, but for the breadcrumb capture, they actually implemented uh, tracker for ArcGIS. So this graphic, uh, uh, at the beginning of the project, we, we, they were moving to ArcGIS 10.7. We had to decide whether, whether they were going to be early adopters to ArcGIS tracker or not, because that was the way Esri was going for breadcrumb tracking. So we decided to go with the tracker solution for this part of it. So. Um, so the so the tracking is done. So as the guy drives with his leak detection device and he's he's capturing leaks, we're also capturing the breadcrumb and the bread and an FME process kicks off every minute to pull all the points from all the vehicles from um, that have been collected with tracker. Uh, and analyzes them against the pipe network. So we're taking the breadcrumb, the point, analyzing against the uh, pipe network and figuring out which pipes have been inspected with some geoprocessing formulas that require a certain amount of the, of the line to have been covered by points uh, traveling uh, close, enough, um, close enough to the pipe. Um, so every minute this progress keeps up. So he can have, so the people in the trucks can do get a view of the areas they've covered that's refreshed very quickly on a regular basis, but also internally planners and managers and, and staff managing, you know, uh, the routes and stuff, they have an, a picture, a live picture basically of what's being inspected. So of which pipes have been inspected. So the idea of FME's role in this is to take that breadcrumb and decide which actual pieces of pipe, so which line segments have been covered by the inspection. So we have it running every minute. And then there's also a contingency to if there was an interruption or if the guy was outside of a range of, of the automatic update happening and suddenly there's more data to get once an hour, there's a kickoff to capture any missing data, for instance. Um, so that is the geoprocessing aspect. There's also a daily report that's run at the end of the day that calculates how many kilometers have been driven, uh, how many kilometers of pipe network have been inspected and some other statistics that are provided to SAP for the planning department. And the other role FME server does is when the guy comes in at the end of his shift and uploads the leak detection data, um, this was an existing software they already had. So um, the data gets copied to a folder and a directory watch kicks off that, uh, that actually you know, FME server automatically goes and pulls those files and then integrates them as well to the GIS. So FME server is being used to do the on-the-fly geoprocessing, uh, to do um, reporting and also, uh, so those two things on a schedule and to do, um, and to, and to do some integration. So some integration on a daily basis using a directory watcher. The red boxes here are all places where an email gets sent out. So by using FME server, I can set up different kinds of automations like I have here, but I can also monitor and make sure those automations work. So if there's a failure for whatever reason, a network connection has broken down or like, or something has happened, then the GIS staff get an email immediately so they can take action and, and corrective action and, and fix the situation. So for them, it means that they were able to, um, so what they implemented was these three workspaces basically that I explained. And uh, this allowed them to save costs by eliminating paper basically, uh, reducing and du uh, duplicate efforts in field collection. Um, so they're able to optimize their routes better because they're able to see what's being covered and what's going to be, you know, cover multiple programs at once, for instance. And um, there was actually originally, uh, they were actually using paper still in their process before. So this allowed them to fully, you know, digitize their process. Uh, and the real-time capture gives them, um, you know, gives them a real-time picture of go what's going on with their field work, basically. So poll question number three. Poll question number three. So the third, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> in the, in the direct line with what we just discussed. So about yeah, we were just curious what people are tools. using for yeah. to develop applications for the for the field. 
especially in mobile, since it is like an, it, is, it is like a newer technology. Okay, not so much, we, not much surprise. So the Esri tools, standard tools, and the uh, the web tools. Good to know. All right. And the third category that we're going to present today, public safety. So a lot of the challenges that we see people using FME for around the subject of public safety, um, there's a couple of different kinds of uses we tend to see. One is um, and one of the major ones is consolidated and clean address data. Um, definitely, um, you know, we have a lot of clients using FME to push their data to, you know, 911 uh, dispatch systems, to push their data to different applications that uh, might be used uh, in public safety. I mean, the address data thing has a broader scope since like address data often ends up being kind of the basis of a lot of city services. So, um, but it does play an important role in this. And for these purposes, we, we worry a lot about like the, the quality of our address data often. Um, so this is, this is one of the major ways. So renaming addresses, validating addresses, uh, you know, you know, different kinds of things. And also we see it in the cross-referencing of data and drawing to da data together quickly and assessing risk in case of emergency situations. So this comes in kind of two forms. I see a lot of people use FME to do what I call kind of more analytical workspaces where there may be assessing risk by cross-referencing different data together, like which parcels are in flood zones and, and things like this. Might be on a regular basis that they re-crunch this data, might be for a specific analysis um, to assess risk, flooding risk, um, you know, might be other like forest fire, wildfire risks and things like that. We also see FME more in emergency situations, like we've seen some interesting, like, you know, wildfire tracking cases, like pulling data from different feeds and streams and putting them together and putting them in, um, you know, risk management. We do have one, we do have one insurance company that, you know, uh, to, to help with their risk management for insurance policies, they actually use FME to gather like, a, you know, weather feeds to look for, you know, things like hurricanes and earthquakes and things like this and consolidate all this data together for their risk management for their risk management tools. Um, we also see it used, um, what I would call kind of for on the fly emergency management. I've seen a lot of people have to quickly put together maps and, and data and like, you know, uh, for different kinds of emergency situations. So uh, we've seen a lot of different kinds of uh, cross-referencing, like even one of my clients, uh, the Ministry of Education here in Quebec, I know he had been using FME uh, when the COVID thing uh, shut down all the schools and they started having to do some really fast calculations and stuff. I know he was using FME to pull together a bunch of information to report on things they were gonna need for information. So the one of the projects I was going to present today, uh, the case of uh, Terrebonne. Terrebonne is a, is a suburb here in Montreal, actually, and uh, they're a population of about 100,000. And they used FME. So they only began their GIS program in 2016. So that's their corporate GIS program. They had some, you know, embryonic GIS, but they, uh, they just started then. They're the 10th largest municipality in Quebec. And one of and and when they started their GIS program, they did an analysis of what do we need to start with. And uh, one of the main data sets they realized they needed absolutely was a clean and consolidated set of addresses in the city. And one of the most important reasons for this, and I remember talking to uh, Lucie like at the beginning of this, is you know she said you know we really need clean addresses for our you know for our fire dispatch people and and stuff like that. And so uh, this became one of the main focuses of them starting their GIS project. There was also an enormous amount of internal requests for address information. So it went beyond the scope of just the emergency management, but basically addresses were the basis for assigning services. So when was the garbage pickup? When was recycling pickup? When is, um, when it, you know, what are the street cleaning days? What are the, what are the snow, room? well here in Quebec, what are the snow removal zones? And, and, and stuff, what are the parking rules? Like all kinds of things like that addresses are served by or that streets are served by. 
And addressing, of course, came with a bunch of challenges, right? So they have, you know, buildings that may have multiple addresses on one building, multiple entrances on a single building. Um, and one of the problems with this is sometimes you get a case like this, they would get cases like this where they had a building, you know, that's physically here, but it's addressed on this street, but this street is actually in, this is surface zone too. So this could be this could be recycling days, or this could be different kinds of service zones, and we're on the border of the service zone, and actually this address should be picked up by the green service zone, but if I went with where the point is on top of the building, I'd end up getting, I'd end up picking the wrong service zone to assign to that address. So this was a challenge that they really had. So they might actually even have two addresses assigned to the building, one on road A and one on road B, which, you know, complicates things. So they decided to expand, so they took their existing address point system, decided to have a two system, a two layer system. One would be address points and the other one would be address anchor points. So, a, you know, an address anchor point would tether an address to its road segment so that then you could actually do, a, you know, spatial assignment of all these different zones you know, to each address more appropriately. So, and one of their goals of that was to be able to reduce the amount of not just external requests from the population, but also internal requests who serviced by the zone. And they would have to do some analysis to figure out what all the addresses serviced by a particular zone were. Um, so they developed three workspaces. So one workspace that they, that they deployed on FME server these, I believe, are run in a manual way. So they're workspaces that are run on demand by the by 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 the town people when they by the uh, by the staff when they need to update the data. So they needed to generate anchor points for addresses. So that anchor point layer. So they have a process that regenerates that anchor point layer. They have another process to add to overlay addresses that they need to run on a regular basis with service area. So as addresses get added or changed or uh, or service areas get a, uh, get get modified. They 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 regularly recross reference this data, and they keep basically a table of all the cross reference data, and uh, to be able to feed to websites and stuff like that, so that a citizen can actually type in their address and find out all their services. And they also have another process to do validation of street segments, address ranges. So now we have a clean set of address points, but now we need to match that to a clean to produce and to maintain a clean set of address of street segments with address ranges. So the addresses now have two physical representations, as I mentioned, and now they were uh, now they're able to push that value down to all the municipal services. So they have that cross reference data set that they're that they're able to push down. The other project related to management of addresses um, is a different city in um, the province of Ontario here is the city of Hamilton and they decided to implement a single authoritative data source for civic addresses across the city so they implemented a, a tool called go360 and these addresses though now they need to get pushed down to all the other applications across the city in a timely manner so um, sometimes they were able to hook up with an API automatically but uh, sometimes some processing is required which is where FME came into play in this case, right? So it wasn't a direct push of this record into this field or this record in the in, from one table to a record in a different table, but they have different requirements. Some of the systems require having intersection points. Some of the systems require addresses to all be in one field or addresses parsed out into different fields. So it was very, and there was also variable data quality in the different systems. So this is what they implemented. So AIMS is the name of their address information management system that they use with the Go360 software. So this is where their addresses, their corporate addresses remain. Um, and they use FME and they use FME server to automate uh, processes to push down to all these different applications. So it's a mix of work order management, asset management, permitting, um, GIS um, systems that they're pushing all their address data down to on a regular basis to keep the whole city's keep all the applications up to date and in sync. So there are some challenges. So this is an example of part of one of the workspaces. So in the application called Hanson, uh, work orders can be issued on assets. And um, so if 
Um, and one of the challenges was that uh, they don't all have the same behavior. So if a, if a address is deleted in the AIM system, it needs to be set to retired at Hanson. So they, they have different requirements and how to, how to deal with like, you know, addresses that get, uh, you know, that get deleted or destroyed. So here they're trying to figure out, are there still open work orders associated to an address that's going to be retired because believe it or not that that does happen and so um you know if so then they have to create a report and they have to avoid actually retiring that address so that they don't break something in the actual ac application and if not well then they set the expiry date and they set the expiration so there's there's some business logic that needs to happen in order to keep all these things in sync and that's that's where fme came into play uh, a lot of the challenges too were around being able to match up addresses. So they had to be able to, you know, identify that addresses were maybe parsed out differently in in different applications. Like Darcy Court on the left has no apostrophe, and on the right it does. And some, you know, it, you know, some systems use road R O A D, and some use road R D. And even though you might want to consolidate, it's not always possible to to um, to to change the way the downstream system holds holds the data for instance so the results uh, they had is that with fme server they were able to automate pushing data down to all these particular different systems so, and some systems were, were writing into a database and updating data and some systems you're writing to an api a system like amanda a permitting application you're pushing uh, data through an actual api doing uh, rest calls so each of them has their their particularities the fourth subject um, is uh, public engagement. So the pain points, oh, oh no, we weren't at the poll yet, but I guess we'll do the poll. <laughs> what element of public engagement is important to your organization? Um, yeah, so, you know, is it accountability? Is it getting, is it improving level of services for citizens? Is it, you know, is for is for you your main concern we're, to open we're, data? We're, we're, we're just in advance of the uh, last subject yeah yeah but if people can just answer because the poll is out there now so yeah it doesn't matter <laughs> yeah Let's see what the result is getting input from citizens oh. clients improve level of services wins exciting that's interesting yeah that's it interesting. is interesting it is interesting I mean, we are seeing more kind of citizen engagement kind of application. I mean, they were definitely one of the subjects of the, uh, like, uh, the Esri uh, UC last year in San Diego. Okay, um, I guess we'll close this. Okay. So uh, pain points we see in public engagement, accountability and transparency, or maintaining and improving level of services. So I'm not going to show an open data example today, but I do want to mention we do have a lot of clients that, you know, pull data from, you know, their town strip fields that are not allowed to be published publicly and, and do some things like this and push it to their you know, ArcGIS open data portals and stuff. So that's a very common use of FME and FME server, um, you know, uh, that, that, we, that we do see and that we've actually, that, that's been, let's say, a common use of FME for a very long time now. Um, so we're going to present, uh, I think, two cases. I'm going to go as fast as I can. So one is the city of Levy implementing a citizen portal, in, uh, in implementing a citizen portal for the management of potholes, <laughs> which is a very fun topic here in Quebec. Um, so because we have winters, we have a lot of potholes and um, they wanted to provide better transparency to the management of these potholes. So they created a citizen portal allowing citizens to capture with their phone or capture in a web application, you know, uh, on a desktop to go and, and, and report on the location of a pothole they have seen. And also, though, to get, you know, feedback, to know that that pothole is going to be corrected and to know, to get feedback and to know that, you know, there's going to be, you know, it's going to get addressed, this problem. Um, 
so some of the challenges uh, is that the information can be, so the information about potholes is gathered multiple ways. So either by citizens putting it into the portal saying, hey, there's a pothole here, but they, they also have their staff out there. Their staff are also capturing potholes with GPS, you know? So they have a GPS device and they, they, they take the measurement on the location of the pothole as well. So we need to pull information from these different places. And um, so between the citizen facing tool and the, uh, and the field workers and push it to the internal management tool that allows them to, you know, do work assignments and assign work to actual field workers who are going to go and actually, you know, fix the potholes. So this is the solution. Um, it is written in French, but I'll explain how it, how it works. Um, so, you know, just for, for fun anecdotal reasons, uh, what we call potholes in French, nid de poule, is uh, chicken nests. So, you know, uh, interesting lesson for today. We have, so this is a, you know, chicken nest <laughs> management application. Sorry, laughing at my own jokes. Okay, so the, this is where the citizen is Im implementing their their information of potholes that they capture. And this stream of information is the potholes being captured from the GPS, the handheld GPS device that the staff members have. So when they come in from their work, those files from their GPS get uploaded to a folder that FME automatically picks up and pushes into the pothole layer. The, the data that's captured from the, from the form from the website is also pushed into the pothole layer. And some work is done to join things together, to you know, uh, put the points in the proper place in the road, and some some rework is done with some ArcPy on the back end here, and then it goes into the work order management layer, which the assignments get done with this application. So there's a web tool internally that allows people to assign work, you know, group potholes together and assign work for the day, and to code them as you know assigned for repair. Uh, and then as they get repaired, all the potholes that get repaired get captured by those GPS devices as well uh, by the field staff, which also get placed into a folder that FME server automatically picks up, joins to the public work so they can publish onto the portal what the status of those pothole repairs is. And they also um, add uh, it to the you know, pothole repaired list. So they're able to provide the information on a round trip back to the internal staff so they can follow the work being done, but also back to the citizen portal so people can see that potholes have been assigned, that potholes have been repaired. FME, in addition to this, FME server is also running a weekly report that they published their open data site to show the number of potholes that have been, you know, reported, the number of potholes that have been repaired. So here, for instance, they, four potholes were reported for this, um, for this borough in the city, but uh, they repaired 15. So, I mean, they are capturing their own data as well and repairing them as they go along. So they're able to, they, they produce this report on a weekly basis. And that's a different view of transparency, right? There are specific cases and where they're at, but then there's also a global transparency view of here's the city and here's the work the city is doing. Um, so this has allowed them to optimize the pothole repair workflow. So 23 working days less is what they estimate that they saved, but at the same time also improve their customer service. 80% uh, less calls since 2018 is what they report on. So less calls of people calling in to say there's potholes. Now there's statistics available and this has also allowed them to pinpoint where more damaged routes might be. So I'm gonna go really quickly through this one because I know we're coming up right at 159. This is an application integrations example. Um, this is for the city of Oakville in Ontario and they use, they use FME server to bridge Salesforce where they have their, their portal for entering all requests down to the department level applications. So what does that mean? Each downstream system has its own API. So the way this works is a case is entered into Salesforce, a webhook in Salesforce pushes the request to FME server where FME server in, so this happens in real time, FME server receives the request and dispatches it down to permitting, work order management, or, you know, finance or asset management, depending on, you know, what their case is. So uh, the technical solution, like I said, so we, uh, webhooks are used to make this basically a, a near real time solution. FME server does the parsing by using the data processes 
And then FME server schedules actually pull the statuses from those downstream systems and pushes them back up to Salesforce so that there is a return of the information. The status of that case gets pushed back up. So it's a real-time application bridge and the you know, they, 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 pro they process about 15,000 new cases per year into the downstream systems, which is about 1,250 cases per month, depending on what's happening in the city. Like right now, I know that they said that there's been an uptick and this process is actually really cr critical to their applications right now in this like new COVID world. Uh, and they push back up about 50,000 to 75,000 statuses back up to the portal per year. So we've seen two cases, FME being used on the back end of a citizen portal to help move the data and information around, and FME also being used as basically a real-time data bridge. So FME server really allows us to like do either you know, near real-time or real-time integration, do scheduled integration, um, notification, or even ad hoc and on-demand processes. So I know we're right we up against the end of the time. <laughs> Yeah, do we have time for questions? I'm asking the uh, Iris uh, Texas uh, well, host. Yeah, we should have a couple more minutes to answer some questions. Uh, I yeah, know there's okay. a couple in the chat. I know, yeah, I know some uh, are on the chat. And so I'll uh, ask Leslie, one uh, that was asked is like, when FNE server is like, is more, is, is, a, is a more, uh, is like adds value to just using like the, the, Windows, task, the Windows task scheduler. Yep. So um, uh, a lot of my clients use the Windows Task Scheduler, and when they kind of run up against the end of doing that, it's often because they've got a number of them running, and uh, then they start tethering on a whole bunch of scripts, a script to see, um, oops, um, a script to see, uh, did my process run? Oh, let me write another script to see if my process ran. And once they start tethering together all those like bits and pieces, they're basically re-architecting FME server using, uh, the, <laughs> using the Windows task scheduler. Then, you know, kind of the cost benefit of maintaining all those extra scripts they're now architecting, usually that's when they, uh, that's when they, because I have a, a lot of local government people who will be, you know, they, they find that, you know, there's a lot of benefits. They have 20 of these things running per day. They also don't want to be running them on people's computers that they have to leave on anymore and different kinds of things like that. That would, that's what I would say would be the common standard local government transition from FME desktop running on a Windows task scheduler to FME server. And then obviously the other is the workflow possibilities. So the Windows Task Scheduler allows you to do something on a scheduled basis, but FME Server, you know, there are some near real-time things, um, frequent schedules, there are some, um, there, there's some on-demand stuff, and FME can take all those multiple demands and put them in a queue and queue up the jobs. So though, though, if you start rebuilding that functionality, then you really should be considering FME Server. Does that answer? Yep, and yep. Uh, I have Maybe like a, a, a last one. I know this one is not easy, but like uh, it was asked, what's the uh, the difference between the Esri Data Interrupt tool and FME? Um, the Data Interrupt tool and FME. Okay. Um, so if I go into my, so if I have the Esri Data Interrupt tool, one of the things it's doing is allowing me to co connect to data formats that FME reads, but in my Esri. And it allows me to build some FME workspaces in the model builder, okay, kind of environment. So, well, like you build a tool, you build an integration tool, and it opens up like an FME workbench. And normally you have a restricted view. Now, I don't have a list of what's in and what's out, but historically it's been most of the things that are in FME, but there might be some things less because originally they were not overlapping functionality that Esri already had. So that was like one thing, although I can't speak to 2020's version. I haven't seen that, but you know, that, that was one of the main differences. The other main difference is when you have the interoperability thing, it's great. And, and we do help people use that. Um, the, the, the thing is when you have to run your uh, um, ETL tool from within an Esri environment. So um, even if you're not dealing with Esri data, so we actually have a lot of clients that will use that FME for a lot of Esri stuff, a lot of Esri data, but also to do things with data that's really outside of the scope of, of, of Esri data. But if you have it in the interrupt tool, you have to be inside Esri to be able to run it. That would be, that would be the main difference. Okay. And do we have like two more, uh, like one more minute? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Adam in the chat. 
that I, I would like to, to hear an answer for too. It's what transformers and FME are being used in these examples, particularly for updating data in AGOL dashboards. Um, usually we're using, uh, we're writing the data to the data sets, right? So when, if we're updating data that's on ArcGIS online, we are updating the, the feature, uh, the feature data set. So we're using the ArcGIS, um, port, like the ArcGIS online writer, if we're going straight to ArcGIS online, um, if it's just a question that's a feature service that's being published from an ARC SDE that's being like shown by an ArcGIS online, we might just be straight up editing the art, like the East Gwillimberry example, we're editing, in that case, we're actually just editing her, um, we're, ju we're just editing her uh, ARC SDE data straight because it's being, it's being served by the feature service and then, you know, so there are cases where sometimes we have some scripts that, you know, will stop a feature service if we're doing a mass reload and then restart the service. There's, there's some workflows around that um, using some Python sometimes. And then in other cases we're writing, there's different writers. You can write straight to a portal feature service or you can write straight to an ArcGIS online feature service. Those writers are being used as well. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, well, that, that, that was my question. So like, to me, like, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. um, yeah, we're about six minutes past right now. seems like yeah. we still have some people sticking around, but if anybody has any questions for Leslie or Francois, uh, we'll, we'll, we, we can print out this, uh, per zoom and, and, and get answers to those and post them to you all. So if you have anything, uh, by all means, let us know. Really want to thank, uh, Leslie and uh, Francois for being with us today. Uh, it's a great speaker series, a lot of information, and um, uh, I think it was well worth uh, the time to go through the information and, and, and delay the Q&A a little bit, but uh, it, was, it was fantastic. We really appreciate y'all being here today, especially from so far away. So, and, and, and especially in this, this, you know, weird times we're all in. So everybody stay safe and we will see you again in May, or uh, sorry, this is May, in June for our next uh, <laughs> next speaker series in Mappy Hour. So please check our website out. Dylan, anything from you? Uh, no, Leslie, Francois, uh, like Brian said, thank you so much for being here and sharing all this with us. I know it's just the tip of what FME can do for, for people and organizations and their workflows. So can't wait to, to hear more from y'all in the future. And we would love to have you back eventually. It's great. a great pleasure to work with you guys uh, here in Texas. So yeah, it will, like we will, we will organize something. We'll just have to think of uh, something that will add value to your uh, community. So once again, thank you very much for inviting us. It's extremely appreciated. Very good. Well, everybody stay safe and uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye.